I was three years old when my father and my mother and uh, all of us, we moved here. And the place to move to in those days was Barales. That's the only place um, everybody knew. People don't realize this, but people came from all over the country because of the rail yards. I worked for the railroad uh, right out of high school because that was the only job. That was a good job, you know. We had everything here, more than any kid could ever want. You know, we had a community center right in our back. We had the Tingley Field across the street. We had the zoo. We had the Bosco. And I remember as a kid sitting out on 4th Street and watching all these cars going by and some would have on the windows, California or bust. We thought, wow, look at those people going to California, you know. There was a lot of poverty in the area. And uh, I just took it as a matter of fact, you know. That's just the way life was. But back in the day, you had Italian and German and Polish and all these folks who came to work at the rail yards. Well, of course, um, uh, when the tra when when uh, when that closed, it created a huge a huge economic vacuum. When we opened our business here in '78, I would say that 75 percent of the businesses were gone. But it has changed. It, it lost its sense of um, the, the the sense of community was was starting to be chipped away. And throughout all of those years and all those developments, is there's this resiliency in the people here and people saying, like, we're not going to just abandon it. What really appeals to me is, is the history, the soul, the heart of the people. Because we had a sense of culture, a sense of, of belonging to something that was very important. And that's who we were as Hispanic people living in a Hispanic neighborhood. Anyone that would love to come and live here and help us improve it and help us make it grow, bring it back to life, that would be great. This may wind up being a very cool, hip place to be. Smiles were in the air, and so was the fragrance of roasting chile verde and hot tortillas, supper for the hungry workers. The air was heavy with the damp smell of just watered gardens, dirty with the bad smell of sewage that drifted up from the sewage plant in South Barelas, and acrid with the salty sweat smell of the grimy workers from the railroad yard. The heart of Aztlan, Rudolfo Anaya. Perhaps no Albuquerque neighborhood can match the legacy of Barelas. The unassuming community south of downtown belies its stature as an historic transportation route, job magnet, and repository of Hispanic culture. Author Rudolfo Anaya, U.S. Senator Dennis Chavez, and war hero Pete Padilla called Varela's home, as did beloved curandera Maclovia Zamora, who tended to the sick with her herbs, roots, and powders. Like much of New Mexico, Barelas also bears the marks of economic booms and busts. From the heyday of the Santa Fe Railway shops and Route 66 to failed government policies that contributed to the decline of the neighborhood in the 1960s and 70s and a descent into poverty and crime. Through it all, Bareleños have proved themselves not only proud and resilient, but determined to revitalize the community while preserving its culture and traditions. With the National Hispanic Cultural Center, the rail yards, and the Rio Grande Zoo as cultural touchstones, the neighborhood is poised for a comeback. In 1598, explorer Juan de Oñate first noted the swamplands on either side of the Rio Grande near present-day Barelas as a prime location for travelers to ford the river on the route that would become known as El Camino Real, the Royal Road, from Mexico City to San Juan Pueblo. Originally settled as a private estancia by Pedro Varela, the sparsely populated community was recognized by the Spanish government as an official settlement in 1662. The original boundaries included the river crossing where Bridge Street now spans the Rio Grande. In the 1800s, Barelas grew into a quiet agricultural community and fields were planted west from what is now I-25 down to the river. Settlers built adobe houses along the path of the Camino Real, which became known as Barelas Road. The arrival of the railroad in 1880 augured a dramatic change in the community. The track split Barelas down the middle, disrupting the agricultural economy. But the railroad, roundhouse, and repair shops provided hundreds of jobs and spurred the growth of the neighborhood. The Santa Fe Railway shops 
Albuquerque's largest employer at the time, transformed Barelas from a farming village to a busy blue-collar neighborhood. But back in the day, you had Italian and German and Polish and all these folks who came to work at the rail yards and at least spent part of their, their formative years here. So then you had this big blessing of an employment center, and like we were talking about whoever, Amazon or Tesla, or whatever. Well, that was our Tesla back then. It was a big employment opportunity, created lots of jobs. By 1900, Barrelas had more than 1,200 residents. It received an additional economic boost when 4th Street, which passes through the heart of Barrelas, was designated as part of the original Route 66. Even when Route 66 was realigned along Central Avenue in 1937, Barela still benefited from overflow traffic traversing its busy 4th Street commercial strip. Times were good. Between our house and the, and the, and the ditch, there was hardly anything but just uh, greenery, a meadow. We used to fly the kites there and we'd, uh, we'd go swimming in the ditch, you know, we'd go swimming in the ditch. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a neighbor that had three sons and the name was Tony, Demesio, and Lulu. And she'd get out on the backboard and says, Tony, Demesio, Lulu. <laughs> he said, Tony, Demesio, Lulu. <laughs> it, was, it was so funny. <laughs> Whenever a, a truck would come with, with cantaloupes or watermelons, we'd go down the street, you know, down 4th Street, go down there and, and we'd get couple of the guys with their bikes to go in front of them to slow it down, see? So, so we climb in the back and th throw the food up. <laughs> Isn't that awful? I wasn't caught stealing, you know, I was just having fun. My father uh, was raised in this house. His father had built it. Uh, his father's name was Francisco and my father's name was Frank. So times were rough then. He was a child of the Depression. And uh, he, uh, he got a job at, a, at one of the, the bars downtown as a, as a bar boy. Uh, finally, when uh, he was 16, well, World War II was raging at that time, and uh, he got it into his head that he wanted to join the service. So he and his father signed him up. He was only 16, but they lied about his birth date. So he entered the service and he uh, became a submariner. He was a cook in a submarine. So my memories of my father are of this tough, big guy. He had tattoos up both arms and he had big, strong arms because he was a machinist and he had to work really hard. He looked like Popeye. And I, I asked him, you know, what, well, gee, Dad, why'd you get so many tattoos? And he said, well, you know, at the time we thought it didn't really matter because you know, we thought we were all going to die, you know. And the submariners, they had a high fatality rate. While many of the neighborhood's young men went off to serve in World War II, the rail yards kicked into high gear, employing shifts of workers around the clock. The rail yards would remain a major employer for some time. Our life was, uh, was dictated by the whistle that would go off for the change of shifts. So, you know, go off in the morning for, to call the workers to work, and that was our cue to get up and go to school. Then it would go again at lunchtime, and I guess after lunchtime, to get them back to work, and then at the end of the day. And that was always kind of one of the things, you better get home before the pito blows. That's what we called, we refer to it. And that meant that's when Dad comes home, because we ate our meals together. My family worked for the railroad. My grandpa was a supervisor, and my, my dad was a supervisor. We had three brothers, Tony, Fred, and me, who were sheet metal workers. And my, my kid brother was a machinist. So we all lived in the neighborhood close to work. We could get to work in 15 minutes, you know. I'd always sleep till, till the, when the whistle blew at quarter to eight. I'd get up and run to work. <laughs> and my foreman would be right there next to the clock. You just made it, you just made it. <laughs> Many remember the post-war years into the 1950s as the heyday of Barelas. My neighborhood, Barelas, was more than just a neighborhood. It was like a village because 
Our extended family lived here, our grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins. We had everything here, more than any kid could ever want. You know, we had a community center right in our back. We had the Tingley Field across the street. We had the zoo. We had the Bosque. Uh, it was a time when the city zoo didn't have a fence around it. And I still recall that you could walk through the zoo at any time. It was a much smaller zoo then. And I recall in the summertime, we would go fish at Tingley Beach. And we would fish till the evening. Here we are, just a young little boys walking back at night. And we would walk through the zoo. And, uh, I, you know, I just reflect back on that and how safe it was that us as little boys could stay out till dark and walk back home without our parents worrying about us being abducted and, and who knows what happened that. It was a whole different era. It was a really good time. My mom used to, uh, every summer she would go to the Wagner Farms and pick chili and vegetables and uh, everything she could and then she would come home and she would make uh, ristras, the, the red chili ristras and she would hang them all around the house so they would dry in the sun. And then uh, once they were dry, the neighbors would come and steal them. <laughs> but <laughs> that was part of her life. My poor mom, she worked so hard. <laughs> well, my earliest memories were, um, this was a young neighborhood at the time. There was kids all over the place. Uh, I remember waking up on on uh, summer mornings and at the Barales Community Center, you could hear a bunch of kids screaming and hollering, you know, uh, they were playing baseball. I was six years old. Six years old, and I went with my brother Isaac, who was my older brother, and uh, we used, he used to sit me on top of the papers, the bundles of papers, in front of Walgreens there in second and uh, central. We used to sell our papers for seven cents each, and we used to get half a penny a paper. Everybody went to El Cambio. It was in the corner of Bridge and Borales. And yeah, there was a lot of bars also, a lot of bars. Almost every corner had a bar. It was a very prosperous area. Well, back then, this was about the uh, middle 50s, you could go to the uh, chemo for uh, 10 cents. You could buy a soda for a nickel and a popcorn for a dime. My grandfather, if he gave us some money, a quarter was a lot of money then, we would go out there and just have the greatest time. The interesting thing about catching movies there, you would not see a movie once. It was part of the tradition. You would see it twice to get your 10 cents worth. On the south end of North Barreras, you know, uh, when I was growing up, we. We still had dirt roads. We still had um, uh, outdoor toilets and things of that sort. And other neighbors still had outhouses that were still uh, operating. That was in the 50s, you know. And so while the city was at our doorstep and the railroad and you know, the rest of the world was just a few blocks away, we still had this. When I was working towards my teaching degree and uh, we were talking about literacy and I said, well, you know, when we grew up, we, we learned from the Dick and Jane primers, right? And nobody in those books resembled anything what we, 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 like we lived. I think, you know, my dad came home greasy because he was a machinist. My mom didn't make tortillas with a nice dress and, and jewelry on. And I said the only thing I could identify with was spot the dog because everybody had a dog. But their memories are tinged with reminders of prejudice. Uh, there was a time when uh, Barenas, if you said you were from Barenas, people would say, you live there. Oh, you live in that part of town, you know, which I guess was meant to be like you live on the wrong side of the tracks or something. Yeah. And so early on, you start getting that sense of, well, is this, you know, not good? Uh, there was uh, discrimination at the Santa Fe Railroad, and, it, uh, and, and that was in the era that my dad was a young man working there. My dad was very fair uh, in his complexion. He had red hair and blue eyes. But my dad was about as Chicano as you could be. Anyway, they offered him a position as a foreman, one of the uh, supervisors there, because they saw him. And then they came, they asked him to come in and they interviewed him. Well, my dad had a very distinct Spanish accent. The job was not given to him after that. Because I was Spanish in the railroad, I could never be foreman. So the, the guys, the Spanish guys told me, he says, you know, you're just, a, you just graduated, you're, You'll never be foreman. He said, "Get out of here." And this uh, guy, Shelby, had him. He was a machinist, and I, and he was just standing by the machine, you know. 
And I'd walk by him every morning and say, what a freaking waste. What? But he'd use a bad word, you know. <laughs> what a freaking waste. He says, get out of here. What are you doing? I said, what's wrong with you? He said, God, Eloy, I just barely graduated. You were on the honor roll all through high school. What are you doing here? Get out of here. <laughs> so, so when I got on the GI Bill, I, I started college and took through a pre-dental. And when I went to dental school at Washington University in St. Louis, I was dating this girl from the Heights. I was driving my car, and I asked her, let's go to Barelas, just for the ride. And she meant, and, and when I said that, she looked at me and goes, no. I said, why not? They kill people in Barelas. <laughs> they kill people in Barelas. That's why I don't want to go. <laughs> Which uh, is like, Kind of funny to me, you know. I mean, I, I mean, I walked through Valeras day in and day out. One o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, I was walking home from downtown to Valeras. And uh, during the day, of course, you know, back and forth. And I never had any any real problems like that. And one time, I was at a party, and uh, people were talking about the area of Barellas and how they were afraid to go over there. And I remember asking them why. And one lady said, oh, I hear that uh, the girls over there carry knives in their hair. And I'm like, really, you're kidding me? I said, well, look at me. I says, do I carry knives in my hair? What do you think about me? And she said, oh, no, you're OK. You're very nice. Why? Because I said, I am from Morales. I was raised there. That was my place. This is, and it's not like that at all. It was, it was this rep that everything uh, that it was here was bad and that was wrong. It was a bad reputation. It was a lie. People here were decent people. And people here were good people. And people here were salt of the earth, as my father and mother were, as many of the parents here were. I was always very proud to say, you know, that I live in Barilas. As Albuquerque entered the 1960s, a series of events conspired to depress the economy and plunge the working class neighborhood into poverty. The construction of a new interstate north of Central was the first sign of trouble. We used to go fishing uh, on the irrigation ditches in the river just north of Central. It's by the, the Botanical Garden. At that time I was 13 and we went walking and all of a sudden we saw these huge pilasters going up, up from the river. And we said, what the heck is that? Well, it was the beginning of the interstate. When I was growing up, a lot of things were being torn down here in Albuquerque. The interstate had come through. Uh, downtown started to die. Uh, the church that was the center of our uh, neighborhood, Sacred Heart Church, was torn down. Uh, Tingley Field was torn down in the late 60s. Uh, the Alvarado Hotel downtown was torn down. So when I was coming through, things were changing, and there, uh, there was a, like a decay beginning in this neighborhood. Shopping malls built in the 1960s in the Northeast Heights further eroded downtown's commercial base. When the Santa Fe railway shops began downsizing, the move fractured the neighborhood's economic backbone. Operations remained open for some time, but the number of people employed at the rail yards plummeted from 1,500 to 100. Although the rail yards had powered the growth of Albuquerque, Barelas itself was neglected. That neglect led to the city's decision to launch an urban renewal program that would relocate families from South Barelas, also known as Tortilla Flats, in preparation for an industrial park. Well, the biggest change in the neighborhood is when they relocated South Barelas, the poorest area of Albuquerque. The thing that was not good is they had the city sewer down there. It was right next to the neighborhood. That area always had that fall smell, and if the wind was blowing them in the wrong direction, you smelled it. They also had further down on 2nd Street, they had a, a um, slaughterhouse. This, the street got the uh, nickname of being uh, El Calle de los Perfumes, the street of perfumes. And as it continued, it just got worse and worse. You couldn't even be in your house with air conditioning. It would suck the smell in and you couldn't enjoy, you know, even just an evening, and definitely one didn't want to be outside, you know. And that's why 
really all those neighbors down there were relocated at one time because they got tired of, of uh, the neighbors complaining and the city had a uh, model cities program at that time. And they said, you know what, we'll just move the neighbors out of there, that will resolve the problem. No, you know. And uh, you know, we recollect on that, when there was human beings live there, living there, the uh, law was to be in the city where they didn't care. And then when they turned it into an industrial area, industrial zone, that sewer was gone. A lot of my friends lived in South Bad Edlis. I had several friends, I remember going down there to visit them, and, and then all of a sudden there was, there was a whole neighborhood gone. You know, it, you know, by then, of course, I was older, but it seemed, you know, it was like surreal. How do you just get rid of a whole neighborhood? And when that happened, um, there wasn't enough people in the neighborhood to support the businesses, and you just saw one right after another closing. It was supposed to bring all this, you know, industry into the neighborhood and create jobs, and it really didn't do that. They ended up in all different parts of the city and most of them were low-income areas. So that group of people that knew each other all their lives no longer had their neighbors, no longer had their friends that, that uh, were so much a part of their life, a good part of their life, that was gone. That was probably the saddest thing about the changes in Albuquerque at that time. Finally, in 1974, the construction of Civic Plaza blocked 4th Street and cut off Barrelas from the rest of the city it would soon encounter many of the problems typical of inner city neighborhoods, namely crime and drug abuse. And many residents and businesses would escape to other parts of Albuquerque. But it has changed. It, it lost its sense of, um, the, 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 the sense of community was, was starting to be chipped away because we no longer had a main street. And then people started moving out. I did. I moved away to, uh, to the west side of town when I got married. Some, like Michael Gonzalez, decided to stick it out, though. When we opened our business here in 78, I would say that 75% of the businesses were gone. It, was, it almost looked like a deserted <laughs> neighborhood. It was, it was pretty bad back then. And I, I guess the reason I decided to stay here is because I was born and raised here. Uh, my family's been here for four generations, and I just felt an inner desire to try to, to get something going here in the neighborhood again. And we were lucky that, that we survived because it was pretty tough that there at the beginning. So that, for some reason, uh, it turned into kind of like a political place to hang out. You know, we started getting the, the people from the city, state representatives, we used to get Dominici coming in and Bingham in and, and, um, and then we uh, even had Bill Clinton come in when he was the governor of Arkansas to us and at the time we didn't know who he was, you know, he's the governor of Arkansas, okay, okay, you know, and then a few years later he became the president of the United States, so that was kind of cool. <laughs> because we get to see the world without moving, you know, we you know, we, we got to see President Obama. I mean, that was a huge thing for us. And this man's walking in and I'm like, oh my gosh, it really is a president. We were so sh surprised and shocked. The coffee house, I think Barela's Coffee House um, has a life of its own. And it, I think it really does give pride and um, just, I think like, People feel that they're, it's worth something, you know, for the area, for the Varelas neighborhood, because there's not much and there's, there's not a lot that has stuck it out. The neighborhood's renewal would begin in the 1990s with plans for the National Hispanic Cultural Center. In 1994, the New Mexico legislature appropriated $12 million to construct the cultural center and the city donated 12 acres in what was formerly South Barrelas. After some controversy, construction began in 1999 and the center opened in 2000. Well, there's almost like a re renaissance going on because of the Hispanic Cultural Center. When that went up, all of a sudden they, they cleaned up 4th Street. There, all of a sudden what happened is people started taking advantage of some of the loans to remodel their homes. 
And there was one lady, and uh, the house is still on the property there near the um, Hispanic uh, Cultural Center, the National Hispanic Cultural Center, Mrs. Martinez. And anybody who remembers the news during that time, the newspaper, uh, that lady refused to move. So many of us in, uh, in older Hispanic communities, and this is with, uh, with Native Americans, you know, probably the most important uh, part of your life is where you're born. And the actual ground, I mean, understanding that, you know. So in Ms. Martinez's case, that would have been, you know, ripping her heart out. And I remember talking to her daughter, because I knew the family well, the neighborhood there. And I, I remember telling her, uh, that I had heard people say that, oh, now that her mother had passed away, now she would, you know, uh, decide to move. And I remember asking her about that. And then her daughter's name was Josie. And she said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> she said, my mother would come back from her grave. <laughs> like the pachucos, the curanderas, the fiestas de las posadas, Adela Martinez would remain an enduring symbol of the culture of Barelas. The opening of the Albuquerque Hispano Chamber of Commerce and Barrelas Job Opportunity Center in 2001 also furthered economic development in the neighborhood. Throughout this period of rapid change, residents would take an active role in determining the future of the area even as gentrification began to impinge. What sets uh, Barrelas apart uh, for me is, uh, has been the activism of the, of the neighborhood. The, uh, uh, the engagement of, of the residents um, in, in the betterment of their neighborhood and, and never taking no for an answer. The Barelas Neighborhood Association and the Barelas Community Coalition were two organizations that fought to keep developers and speculators from turning the neighborhood into a soulless bedroom community for downtown Albuquerque and to bring much needed improvements. I think that's been the tension, right? Is is how do you not lose that history and culture and feel and and real realness, right? So we don't want to, you know, become this sort of strip mall kind of uh, place, you know. So and and you know, the economic forces don't always work when you try to do those two things, right? Like preserve the culture and the feel and the authenticity of a neighborhood like Barrelas, while bringing making it a, a, pl a place that's ripe for investments. The history of the Barrelas Community Coalition is that it was formed initially formed as a subcommittee of the Barrelas Neighborhood Association when new proposals began to develop for the redevelopment of the rail yards and the community wanted a voice in the development of the rail yards and so they formed this nonprofit to inform the development of the rail yards as well as prepare and develop uh, affordable housing here in this community as well as provide economic opportunity here in this community. When is it going to happen? It's not a question of if it's going to happen, the question is when and uh, I think the best we can do, and the neighborhoods who've done this well in other parts of the city or around the, around the country um, have tried to get in front of it. And so what we've tried to do and what I've tried to do since I've been in political life and, and more active in the neighborhood has been, okay, uh, how do we make sure we're at the table? How do we make sure that we're not completely sort of handing the keys over to, to, to developers and folks? At the actual uh, listing for the movies that they had uh, made. Instead of of opposing what's coming in and the new developments that are coming in. We're trying to become the organization that's steering the, the development itself and putting community in control of what's going to happen and, and its development of its future. Uh, so we feel that, you know, to, to, to the best way to sort of fight gentrification is to be more proactive about it meaning we start the programs and we initiate the, the development process in ways that we feel are appropriate for the community and really fit the character in the community as it is now. And more than anything, I think it has to be a good open conversation, you know, and I think, I think there are various viewpoints on this. You know, you have folks who have come from a much older generation of advocacy and work and who have been had a strong presence in the community a long time. And then you got some young folks who are very energetic and want to try new things and bring new things into the community. And I think those two things collide sometimes. You know, it's, there's just two generations. I think every community has that. You know, when you have an older generation and a younger generation, they see different things and they, they want to do different things. And things. so I think one of the biggest challenges is bringing those two together to have them both working together to accomplish a common goal. We hope to create a vision that 
and, and a future for, of Butter Lust that has something in it for everybody. Towards that end, the coalition is working with the city and developers to attract and nurture local businesses, keep longtime residents in the neighborhood, and guide development of the rail yard's property. The two big projects that, that are on our plate are the Calle Cuarta Marketplace and, on Cole and Forth, and then the rail yards. Those are the, the big uh, kahunas, if you will. So Calle Forth and Cole is going to be a mixed-use development itself. And the Brothers Community Coalition is looking to start a marketplace there where we'll have different spaces for businesses to come and open up. And they will be uh, provided services and trainings along the way as they develop their business model and begin to understand their market. We then help them move out, to hopefully to 4th Street, where our Main Street program can help them in securing a, uh, their own building and, and rehabbing their own buildings and get supported through the Main Street program. The rail yards market is, is the most successful uh, artisan market in, in the state right now and we're really happy with the results we're seeing and we're seeing a ton of new businesses open up and get uh, a new source of revenue that they depend on through the, throughout the year and it's really created an opportunity for people to leave their traditional work and, and do something they, they love in terms of like perfecting their craft and arts and uh, food, those kinds of things and we're really happy to see a locally based economy growing there at the rail yards market every Sunday um, during the summer. While the rail yard market has proven a hit, much still needs to be resolved about what mixture of housing and commercial uses would serve the needs of local residents. As great as it is that we've saved that asset, it's a tremendous challenge for redevelopment and uh, it, it's going to take generations really to bring it back but in the meantime we've saved it as a historic site. We need to, to grow uh, and I don't and I'm, I'm glad to see that it's not in leaps and bounds. I'm glad to see that people are trying to help it in a, a slower and more um, thoughtful way. Despite the many ups and downs, Baraleños remain hopeful about the future of the neighborhood. For many Baraleños, there is no better place in the city to live. Yeah, we've been here, we've been here forever. I think what makes me hopeful about Badalas is seeing the resiliency of the people here. You know, I think you have people who are so dedicated to the work here. In the last four years that I've been working here, I haven't seen this many people engaged. And it's, it's really encouraging to see this many people working for the betterment of their community. I've always loved Morales. I grew up here, I, I still feel comfortable here, and I wouldn't mind living here in Morales again because um, I feel happy. It is a work in progress and we would, I mean, anyone that would love to come and live here and help us improve it and help us make it grow, bring it back to life, that would be great. I hope that people do move in, I hope they revitalize the neighborhood and I hope they retain its flavor and, and retain its history. I think at some time in the, in the near future this may wind up being a very cool, hip place to be. The ethnic composition of the neighborhood is changing, we have Anglos moving in now. And uh, these people are coming here because they sense that sense of history and that this place is more than just a home, it's a community community that has a long history with many beautiful things in the culture. I think that the potential is enormous um, and it's exciting, you know, it's exciting to live in this neighborhood right now.
make you move your feet from the silver screen to a golden opportunity. Rock the spot, any block, any nationality. So rise up, I'll play my feet, hurt my back aches. I'm on the grind to get mine. It's my world, it's my way from the dirt to the grace, from the bricks to the gates. I'm outbound at a place, a disgrace full of hate. No means or rise on my plate, my feet hurt my back aches. So I'm on the grind to get mine. It's my world, it's my way from the dirt to the grace, from the bricks to the gates. I'm outbound at a place, a disgrace full of hate.